Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. It's fantastic to have you here as ever, because we are working on a Viking sword and we are working on the fine details that are hopefully going to be setting this piece apart from all of the work that I've done so far. The things that will hopefully have set it apart at the beginning of the project were the attention to historical blade shapes, distal tapers, thicknesses, weights, which mean that already this is feeling amazing, and that's before the fittings that get it the appropriate balance. In yesterday's episode, you saw me do a gold inlaid touch mark that I engraved, as well as doing a fine twisted gold wire wrap on our pommel cap. Engraving is a brand new skill to me, and so it's a challenge because I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm excited for that challenge. I'm thrilled to bring you along because we need to get right into the engraving and inlay that we plan to do on the rest of our hilt components. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy. First things first, so that we can make sure that our design works well, I want to be able to have the pommel on the upper guard while the upper guard is on the tang. And so we've got ourselves a little pencil line for where the top of the upper guard sits and we'll cut enough material to be able to pin the tang nicely. We'll do that with an angle grinder. <laughs> On with lower guard, I'll put the silver rivets in the pommel. And, oh, 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 yes. Oh, this is going to be phenomenal. <gasps> Look at that. I think I want to cry tears of joy for just a second. Right. Onto the design. So in my research about the Viking Age swords, I also wanted to learn about the art styles of the periods. In some of the books that I had, I had reference to different art periods within the Viking Age. And being that we want this sword to be of a mid 10th century inspiration, I want the design that we engrave on the rest of our fittings to fit that artistic bill. Some research led me to this person, Jonaslau Markusen, who has the different periods broken down, which means that 900 to 975, the yelling style clearly was rather in vogue, and so I wanted to learn about the yelling style. This guy has some really fantastic resources, and I bought some designs from his website that I could use commercially, which proved to be good inspiration for me to learn about the yelling style a little bit, learn about how they adorned things and the art styles of the time, and you'll see that it often revolves around these beast-looking things all intertwined, figure of eight style, weaving around themselves. This book here, The Viking Achievement by PJ Foote and DM Wilson. And you can see here, this panel here is an ornament of a silver cup from Yelling Holland in about original scale. And uh, it again has these similar beast-like ornamentations. And so when you've seen me practicing engraving work recently, you've seen me doing it with scrolls. The reason for it is that that continuously changing radius of the arc of a scroll that I need to work to, I believe is a really good challenge for being able to eventually do something that's a little bit simpler. On this piece, I want to do an engraving that's a little bit simpler, because the simpler it is, the more likely I am to get it clean, and what I don't want to do is do a complex design as I'm at the very beginning and the very precipice of learning a new skill which takes decades to hone. I don't want to do a complex design and mess it up, I'd rather do a simpler design and have it look cleaner. So, along with practicing engraving scrolls, I've been practicing my drawing skills. I got Sam Alfano's scroll drawing tutorial and just started playing around with scroll designs, doing different drawings to get my hand and eye a little better practiced because my drawing skills are very rusty and they need work. With that practice, I then started thinking about what was the real estate that we were going to have on our sword? What could we work with? What are the proportions? I then looked back at the yelling art ideas and started to think about concepts of intertwining these beasts. But of course, you can imagine if we scale something like this, two beasts intertwining each other down to the size of the real estate we have, we end up doing something incredibly fine and far too detailed for my shaky new hand at engraving to be able to succeed at. And so I thought about it and developed it further and thinking about the idea that, for example, a scroll doesn't necessarily need to fit inside a border for us to get that there is a scroll there and get the beauty of the scroll. You can put a border over it like this and still look at it and go, wow, there's a beautiful scroll in there. It's just covered up by a border. Operating on that principle, I thought, well, okay. Have our yelling Viking beasts overpassing the border on the inside, so to speak, giving us the impression that within these pieces is a much bigger beast than 
than we might imagine. And so I continued thinking about it and developing the ideas until this point here, where I now have a concept that I am happy to work with. The concept is as follows. My large Viking yelling beast, and it's so large that it wraps all the way around each of the guards. Side one will begin on one side of the upper guard, and then side two, the front half of the body, will come back around and complete itself on the rear, and we'll have the opposite done on the lower guard, where we'll have the face coming across in the opposite direction, and the rear of the animal coming across in the other. And I'm really excited for how this is gonna look. It's gonna make it look like trapped inside of this sword, these two beasts with serpentine bodies wrapping around themselves and so large that they have to come all the way around it. I'm really excited for that. I'm really pleased to have spent a good little bit of time thinking about this design because I think that it's a good enough design that provided I take enough care in executing it at my very, very beginning skill level of engraving, I can succeed and I think that it's an interesting enough design with enough meaning to it to mean that it adds to the piece and isn't just embellishment for the sake of embellishment. So what I want to do with these designs is I want gold wire inlay along these lines of our serpentine beasts, steel in the middle, gold on the edges, and to create contrast and shadow and more color and intrigue to the piece. I then want to remove the background. Two weeks! since the first time I engraved anything and I'm trying to do this, pfft, never bitten off more than I could chew in my life. Right, let's do some practice. Here's a little practice piece that I did the other day, just experimenting with background removal and stuff like that, and some silver inlay. I wanna do a little more concentrated practice to help better gather and work out what my order of operations are for once we get into the actual piece and the gold. And so here we go. <laughs> This has been phenomenally educational doing this little practice piece and I'm happy with how it turned out despite all the mistakes that I made and I'm happy with how it turned out because of those mistakes because I've learned a lot. I now know that sterling silver wire will dent the steel. I now know that I need to use thicker wire than half millimeter, but thinner than a millimeter. I also now know that I can use a ball burr on my pendant drill to rough out the background. And I also know that roughing out the background gives phenomenal contrast as I hoped, it makes it look beautiful, it captures the light, and helps make that beast stand out. I also know that making that background has its risks with a ball burr, and it's very easy to slip. Now, I was talking about wire size for a second there. I only have two sizes of fine gold wire. I have half millimeter gold wire, and I have millimeter gold wire. And I also can't find anywhere that sells fine gold wire between 0.5 millimeters and one millimeters. I can only find one or the other. So thank goodness, we are no strangers to these type of problems and here if you're subscribed you'll be very familiar with, with the fact that when we when we find ourselves with an obstacle we certainly enjoy solving said obstacle by making our own tools so in with some steel on with the bandsaw and into the mill for us to make what's called a draw plate well I'm embarrassed to say that sometimes the whole need a tool make a tool thing just doesn't make any sense. Today is one of those times. I snapped so many drill bits and spent so much time drilling what ended up being only four holes that it would have been a far better use of time and money to have just ordered myself a draw plate for 35 pounds. You win some, 
you lose some, I just lost one. My understanding from there is once you have your wire, here we have some sterling silver wire just to practice with. You poke it through and, oh, 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 I just pulled the wire off. Going well. Put a little oil on it. You pull it. I broke the wire again. Uh, uh, I really should have bought it. Let's try kneeling it again. Oh, oh, oh. I've just ordered the draw plate and the requisite tongs to be able to properly do it. So tomorrow we're going to be able to change the diameter of a piece of gold wire. And today, the first step on the guards is going to be chiseling our border for our inlaid gold. I want to use every single bit of real estate that we have on here. So we're going to have that border come as far out as it can. I'm going to cut some tape into an oval shape and we'll stick it on to protect the steel. There we go. We'll pop it in the vise and give it a squeeze. This is gonna be the most difficult thing I've ever done. Here we go. The first cuts on the upper guard. Let's hopefully not. Oh, I scratched it already. Oh, come on, Alec. That's no way to start. Oh boy. Oh! How do I let that happen? Oh! I have a feeling there is no way to avoid all the scratches I'm going to be putting in this piece. Oh, and again. These last three minutes tell a foreboding tale of what is to come. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh. Oh wow. That was absolutely petrifying. Good news is, whew, we're like a quarter of a percent of the way there. And that is now 0.26% of the way there. Side one border engraved. Woohoo! Here we go. Oh, I dropped it. We have two sides with some surprisingly straight looking lines cut in, ready for the gold inlay. Just to quickly help remind you about what it is exactly we're doing, we're using a flat graver which has a 45 degree face, about a 15 degree, something like that, heel. That cuts ourselves a channel. In that channel, we take an onglet graver and we create an undercut to create the dovetail. Then I take a slightly narrower tool or the same tool that we cut the channel in and we raise some teeth in there by hammering alternately from this angle and then from that angle in between those marks. That gives it a dovetail and that gives it teeth and with the limited amount. I mean, I'm at the very beginning of this. I'm the very, very beginning, but with the inlays that I've tried, that's given me pretty decent success. And it was that type of technique that allowed me to get the S in our pommel the other day. We're gonna call it there for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope that you stick along for what is gonna be an extremely exciting build up to the end of this project. Of course, when I started making near daily YouTube videos two years ago, the whole point was to bring you along the journey of what I make each day. It feels pretty crazy to think about what I've learned in that time. I never would have imagined that I would be trying to do gold inlays and engraving. It is a true honor and pleasure to bring you along. I hope you subscribe if you're new for more of these daily episodes. Cannot wait to see you tomorrow on the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.